perhaps we can learn to live in the cracks of reality or made it a valuable sight all the same. Themes and messages, they exist in the few invulnerable frames of a dodge roll. Staying alive for every species requires livable collaborations. Collaboration means working across difference, which leads to contamination. Without collaborations, we all die. Anna Lauenhaupt Singh. Citizen Sleeper was a game that I went into blind, not long after it had first dropped onto Xbox Game Pass. I think I had just come off of my latest attempt to try and complete Elden Ring, a failed attempt I might add, and I wanted something different. I wanted something shorter, something that was more of a relaxed playthrough, as opposed to the skill-based adrenaline spikes of boss fights and dragons. Citizen Sleeper was shorter, for sure, in terms of a single playthrough at least. But as for relaxed, kind of, but also not really. Confusing, right? The time pressures of Elden Ring are micro-scaled. They exist in the few invulnerable frames of a dodge roll or in the fraction of a second you have to make a parry attempt or in attempting to get that last slither of boss health when you should really just be trying to stay alive. Citizen Sleeper, however, also has a very intense relationship with time and though the speed of your reactions are not so much a factor, the weight of time feels so much heavier. Don't misunderstand me, you can take as long as you want with any decision in the game, but rest assured, every move you make will cost you. Much like one of my favourite games, Superhot, time and action are inherently connected, progressing with every step, allowing you to occasionally simply remain still, surveying the world around you, weighing up the consequences of your next action, judging the severity of all possible outcomes. However, much like Superhot, there are times in Citizen Sleeper where the pressure of possibility weighs heavy and the results seem dark and inescapable and relentless. Maybe instead we could just stay here in this moment. Maybe if we don't move, maybe if we hold on to this space between actions, we can avoid the dangers of material existence. What if we were to reject the dominion of time? Perhaps we can learn to live in the cracks of reality forever, without ever needing to know what is on the next page. But of course, we can't help ourselves, can we? Citizen Sleeper is about how we choose to assign what time we have. It's about how we portion out little increments of our life. It's about how best to spend our waking moments. And it is about how there is an entire system out there designed to ensure that these precious moments are spent serving agendas other than our own. In this video, I want to first talk about the setting of the game, the politics, economics and culture of its reality, before going on to looking at the themes and messages, both explicit and personal, before finally summarising what I have gained from playing it and what Citizen Sleeper has to say about life in the 21st century. Start the timer. Prep your next dose of stabiliser and brace for arrival, comrades. It's time to wake up. The Sleepers. Imagine, if you will, a future where capitalism remains the dominant economic and political force, continuing to pursue growth in an environment where resources grow increasingly scarce and where the only room left to grow profit is by looking to the stars. Maybe there was a brief period of relief as mankind began exploring and exploiting the resources of the planets and comets around it. Though, with the excitement of these new income streams comes the increased costs of space travel, colonisation and terraforming. The Sleeper character remarks on how these costs were often pushed on to those least likely to benefit from these ventures. You wipe a layer of dust from the cracked screen, thinking of those contractors squeezed by their corporate employers to pay for every bit of minor maintenance on their rented ships. Indeed, as that same titular sleeper once remarked, the hope of a better future, engineered to line someone else's pockets. It's an idea you are intimately familiar with. The few remaining labour laws stopped the corporations just short from working their workers to the literal bone, but as with all things, the corporate lawyers came up with an idea. Labour laws only apply to people, to human beings. So what if they could simply create a workforce that wasn't that? What if there was a fully constructible biomechanical body with the ability to consume food for energy, but with the human capacity to comprehend and understand? You could call these frames, perhaps. It wouldn't take long for those with sufficient capital and enough shareholder pressure to develop the technology to simply take an existing intelligence and emulate it. Taking a specific human's consciousness and creating a digital map of their mind, one that could then be uploaded into our biomechanical frames. Enter the sleeper. Sleepers aren't people, you see. 
They are biomechanical robotic suits, piloted with a copy of a person's mind and personality. As the enigmatic data vendor Castor later puts it, the past you is not just an idea, a concept for you. It is a living, breathing person. You split from them like a shadow splitting from its caster. They may be sleeping now, yes, but one day they will awake and carry on with their lives, unaware of your fate, no matter what it might be. Sleepers could be worked harder, in harsher conditions for longer, and would require less sustenance. And theoretically, they could live as long as they were needed. The perfect labour. Sabine, the sympathetic doctor, puts it like this. Emulations like you, sleepers, as most people know you, aren't classified as people in any of the surrogate systems. You have no rights, no status, and SNARP has no reason to release Stabilizer to the market. So they can't unionise, they don't get paid, they don't get sick, they can't be distracted with thoughts of settling down, having kids or going on vacation. But what would there be to stop these emulated selves simply escaping as soon as their minds were transferred into their frames? Surely the realisation that an immortality consisting only of slave labour and nothing more would lead to sleepers making for the door at the first opportunity. Trackers could be fitted of course, but they're not infallible, and the pursuits would be expensive and time consuming. That is non-optimal as a first deterrent. You could temporarily remove the unnecessary aspect of their memory of course, to stop them being tempted to seek help from family and friends of their original selves, but that is not enough. A more total solution is needed alongside these measures to stop any thought of escape before they even start. You would need to remove hope. What then if these frames had a failsafe, a planned obsolescence that required regular doses of a stabiliser to stop the whole thing shutting down? That would be cruel, wouldn't it? And cruel is exactly what a corporation would do. As the aforementioned street doctor Sabine puts it, SNARP, the company that owns the sleeper, doesn't like to see its proprietary technology let loose. To prevent bodies like yours, frames as they call them, from being stolen, repurposed, or in your case escaping, they built in a process of so-called planned obsolescence. Street Dr. Sabine puts together some of the info for the player. The stabilizer works under a similar principle to an immunosuppressant in a transplant patient, in that it stops your body from rejecting the unfamiliar part of itself. She continues, In the case of your frame, the unfamiliar part is each of your biosynthetic organ groups, which are, over time, identified by your body as foreign material and therefore must be eliminated. This matches up with the rumours the sleeper themselves have heard. Planned obsolescence, a built-in dependence on the regularly administrated supplements that were part of your routine. Stop taking them and your body begins to shut down, separate from your emulated mind. How long has it been? How long do you have? Capitalism and slavery are familiar bedfellows, and this sort of development is an entirely believable one. As mankind spreads itself and its capitalist tendrils amongst the cosmos, the ability to develop better workers' rights to cover sleepers would seem nigh impossible, hopeless even. In Citizen Sleeper, you play a sleeper that is faced with such darkness, such mundane evil, that even with the threat of your body shutting down, you and nine others decide to take your chance and go on the run. The sleeper recalls the following. You remember there were ten of you. Ten that could no longer stand the indentured work, the routines, the slow decay. Ten whose belief in their promised future was slowly dismantled day by day until they realised they had sold away everything that could and would ever matter. Ten that would escape, or at least die trying. One thing is for sure, SNARP own you, and they will make an example of you. For seemingly months you drifted until your power levels got so low you had no option other than to go into a sort of hibernation. Now you awake, on a strange station, alone and with no money, no memory of your originator's life, and with the clock ticking before your frame shuts down as it begins to run out of its stabiliser. You don't even know how long you have until that happens. Sleepers are the galactic underclass, ignored, subhuman and unfairly maligned by many. Corporate monster and general snake bastard Hardin outlines fairly bluntly the less kind stereotypes weaponized against sleepers. Your entire existence is proof of your self-interest, signing yourself over to be emulated rather than work yourself. Whether you remember it or not, you suffer from the same short-sighted perspective as the person you were copied from. It is through the struggle of the sleeper that we experience everything that follows. Literally created for exploitation, a new underclass, the sleeper themselves summarizes it thusly. You know this much. You are a convenient loophole, a way of circumnavigating the illegality of sentient AI. After all, 
You are an emulation, not a true digital being. You are neurologically limited, still human. But what would you become if you could escape this frame? Where then would the limits lie? Where indeed? Erlin's Eye is a battered, wheel-like space station on the fringes of corporate space, constructed originally by a gargantuan corporation known as Solheim, which effectively controlled vast swathes of this system, so embedded was it in everyday life. The station was used as a colonial hub, which Solheim used to spread its tendrils into the surrounding planets, seeding colonies in the Hellion system, and acting as a lightning rod for intergalactic commerce. However, around 30 years ago, according to a comment from the game's creator Gareth Damian Martin on the Fellow Traveller Discord, Solheim completely collapsed, taking with it the infrastructure, funding and purpose that was ultimately the reason for the station to exist in the first place. Havenage Systems maintenance guy and all-round solid chap Feng fills you in on a lot of this. I grew up here, sleeper. This is my history. I am a child of the collapse. Before I was born, my parents were Solheim contractors. They ate in Solheim canteens, worked on Solheim ships. They breathed Solheim air and slept in Solheim beds. Feng continues. And the work that paid for that existence? The cycles of hard extraction out in the belt? Solheim took their cut. This was a company town, so to speak, and my parents were just another in the long line of freelance contractors willing to risk their lives for a shot at anything other than poverty. Disposable. It is not made explicitly clear, from what I've seen at least, why exactly Solheim collapsed. Though there is talk of fraudulent activity, hubris and neglect all playing a part, depending upon who is talking about it. Feng gives us a recollection of what he saw and understood via his parents' involvement. I don't know what you know about the collapse, but it wasn't as instant as it sounds. It wasn't like Solheim was here running the station one day, and the next Erlin took power. Back then, Solheim knew this place was slipping away from them. The pay got smaller, the costs higher, people like my parents were forced to work non-stop just to keep a berth on the station and water in their tanks. Solheim squeezed every last worker until the mistakes, the accidents, were coming in non-stop, and as new waves of contractors came in, desperate to work, Solheim welcomed them taking bribes instead of checking pilot licenses. The whole time, Solheim was folding up, dragged into court cases in the central systems, while the severed limb of a station still desperately tried to take all it could. The riots came after the collision at Dock 2. A young pilot, his MEV overloaded with palladium, miscalculated his trajectory and took out a section of the ring. Hundreds died, thousands panicked. My parents told me people were terrified and the blame fell squarely on Solheim. My father joined the improvised crews trying to seal up the ragged edges of the gap. He never came back. They sealed it up though, and by the time they did, Solheim was gone, abandoning every one of us to the black. In the power vacuum that followed, a number of factions began fighting for control of the whole system, and indeed the station itself. As a result of the ensuing conflict and neglect, large parts of the station were damaged beyond the capabilities and resources of those left behind. This effectively broke the station up into segments, which saw regional powers begin to take hold and try to organise life on the station under their own vision of how things should be. Many civilians now call the eye home, though few through choice, as life here is hard and its luxuries few, making it more a haven of necessity than a final destination. Its remote location and lack of economic activity in the local Helian system makes the level of trade coming into the station fairly infrequent, and as a result that means the eye is lacking in anything other than basic necessities most of the time, or items of questionable value. Citizen Sleeper is entirely based on the shattered wheel of Erlin's eye, and you will soon come to know both its physical and networked locations rather well after a time, as well as the important characters and factions that call this place home, at least temporarily anyway. As it is, you awake with little memory, no resources, and with corporate bounty hunters on your tail. It is only through the actions you take and the decisions you make that you might begin to carve out any kind of life here on the eye. Being a sleeper does have occasional benefits, one being the ability to visualise digital networks as if they were a physical framework, and then manipulate the flow of information directly as if moving a cable or using a key in a lock. In this digital world, there exist doorways and data stores, as well as artificial intelligences that wander the pathways like we would travel on roads. In our time exploring these pathways, we encounter the Navigator, an AI that has seemingly evolved sentience and a skill set beyond its original function, further muddying the waters between what we consider alive and simply programmed. The Navigator has this to say. The limits people place on the programs they create are there to comfort, to protect, to imply the kind of certainty the law requires, but in reality, 
They are placebos for the problem of sentience. On Erlin's Eye, you will encounter a number of different network travellers. Some friendly, some dangerous, and some, well, some are simply operating on another level of consciousness entirely. The station is old, and some of its digital infrastructure is virtually forgotten, with artefacts of information still clustered away in the dark corners of the network, its systems and pathways having passed through a number of hands, physical and digital. And of course, where each successor has to make things work without understanding the original designer's intent, the complexity and almost organic development of this other realm expands a little more, creating an unknowable tangle of information that is all that stands between the people of Erlin's Eye and the cold, vast indifference of space. As Havenage Systems agent Feng says, some of these systems are from the original station, the one Solheim built. We've had to invent new components, repair things we never built, reverse engineer entire subsystems into existence. Residents here look up at the eye and think they are seeing a constant, a concrete reality, but this place is in a system of constant flux, decaying and growing, collapsing into new configurations. In this way, the network feels as mysterious and unknown as any physical space you might encounter, and has an almost ethereal quality to it, as if you were wandering a spiritual or supernatural plane as much as a digital one. Indeed, game creator Gareth Damian Martin says in The Art of Citizen Sleeper, Part of being an emulated mind in Citizen Sleeper is that the cloud of networks and systems that we usually think of as separate from us, as digital and inhuman, become a kind of spirit world for sleepers. So when designing the entities and protocols, both sentient and semi-sentient, that exist in this space, I wanted to think of them more as gods and ghosts rather than typical AIs. Information is one of the most valuable commodities in Citizen Sleeper, and your use of the network and the mysterious forces within is a vital route to not just survival, but to flourishing on the station, and perhaps even beyond. The three colonies that you learn of during the DLCs in Citizen Sleeper are Ember's Step, Ember's Hearth, and Ember's Song, which exist in a slightly symbiotic fashion as moons orbiting the Ember system itself. The colonies were outsourced by Solheim to a smaller corporation named Sibel Systems, which is a more specialised enterprise focusing on terraforming. Ember's Step was effectively a trial run used by Sibel Systems, and while they learned a lot about the system, it quickly became clear that it was to be an unstable colony, existing in a fundamentally flawed ecosystem that required constant maintenance to avoid losing its atmosphere altogether. Ember Step is a volatile and sandy desert planet whose environment has led to the development of both unique and hardy plant species and exceedingly resilient colonists, though there may be perhaps a little resentment of their use as a stepping stone on the route to successful colonisation of the wider system. Indeed, as it became clear to Sibel Systems that the moon's irregular orbit was going to make a sustainable atmosphere impossible, their attentions quickly switched to Ember's hearth, leaving the people of Ember Step to face a future with a declining atmosphere and what is an already harsh environment with little little support or resources. Where Ember's Step had a number of factors that made a sustainable environment impossible, Ember's Hearth was just about doable. Sibel Systems committed great resources to the creation of an atmosphere using grand systems of evaporators to create an ecosystem that could sustain life, and that would quickly lead to the establishment of something approaching a city they could be proud of. This city, Passero, quickly grew to have thousands of residents, with many working on maintaining the complex and constantly running terraforming equipment needed to stop Ember's Hearth turning back into a dusty desert like Ember's Step. Ember's Hearth became the beating heart of the system, providing a trade destination, jobs and homes for those seeking a life away from the core systems and seeking their fortunes in the deep, dark infinity of space. Its success, however, wasn't entirely of its own making nor was its success celebrated by all. Ember's Song was never meant to be anything more than it was. Unlike Ember's Step or Hearth, Ember's Song was designed around sacrifice, extraction and pragmatic functionality. Its surface is jagged and cracked open, fractured as it is by volatile tectonic activity and volcanoes, and such a harsh environment makes it an unlikely site for a colony. However, its mineral deposits and geothermal energy potential made it a valuable site all the same, and one that no corporation would pass up. 
As the colony on Ember's Half began to bear metaphorical fruit, it became clear that there was a viable long-term colony here that would need resources to both survive and trade, and so it became clear that a feeder colony was needed nearby. Ember's Song plays the metaphorical role of a proletariat, labouring to produce the raw materials needed for the luxuries and comforts a growing colony like Ember's Half would need. Life on Ember's Half is by no means easy, but there is at least hope and the potential for a better existence. Ember Step has a very harsh, arid environment, with a failing atmosphere and a near total abandonment from their parent corporation. Still they persevere with a hardiness and pride that sustains them where their sponsors will not. Ember's song, however, has no such ideological symbol, nor hope for a better future. There was never any pretense from Sabel Systems, the people of Ember Step or Hearth, and certainly none from those desperate enough to seek employment on Ember's song. Life is hard, and will always be hard and it will never be for their own benefit. A handy reminder then, that poverty acts as an incentive for dangerous and undesirable work, even here, even now. Now that we have an understanding of what the titular sleeper refers to, where we will be spending our time and who the neighbours are, we should return to Erlen's Eye and see who is competing for control of its failing infrastructure and isolated citizens. Just quickly, before we move on to the next part of the video, if you're enjoying what you've seen so far, please drop a like. Um, it really helps the video just get a bit further out there on the algorithm and out to new people. Um, if you fancy it, drop a comment, let us know what you think of the video, and um, subscribe if you want to see more content. Thank you. Cheers. Havenage control the lion's share of Erlin's Eye, and certainly see themselves as the official representation of Station Matters, controlling the shipyards, docks, and several key facilities. According to some sources, Havenage was an industrial union on the station before its current incarnation as an administrative organisation, and it is rumoured to have ties to Andre Erlin, the person whose vision it was to turn the station into an independent hub after the collapse of Solheim. Feng, the aforementioned dude bro of Havenage's systems team, tells us this. Think of us as an administrative association for the lower eye. Depending on who you talk to, we either emerged as a response to, or a continuation of, Andre Erlin's original union. We are keeping this place alive, but also remaking it into something new, dragging it away from those corporate origins. At least, that's what I'm trying to do. However, whatever priorities it once held as a union are fading into memory as it transforms itself into something akin to one of the corporations, dominated as it is by administrative duties that distance its decision makers from the day-to-day -day lives of residents on the station. Feng himself mentions on a number of occasions his doubts about the integrity of Havenage and whether it can withstand attempts to coerce or manipulate it into an uglier version of itself, relying on embedded hierarchies of political and class power. Havenage might be born out of Erlin's revolutionary zeal, but a flat hierarchy it is not. In taking up the mantle of running the station, Havenage have jerry-rigged a bunch of workarounds and shortcuts that allow them to keep things ticking over, though in truth they know only a little more than the average person about how the station really works. It is another indication of Gareth Damien Martin's willingness to blend our understanding of technology with the ethereal enigmaticism of something approaching a magic or alchemical pursuit, one where the importance lies in the end result, with any lack of clarity merely a fact of life when living in a prismatic wonder like Erlin's eye. Feng himself, one of the foremost experts on the station's systems and maintenance, adds, Some of these systems are from the original station, the one Solheim built. We've had to invent new components, repair things we never built, reverse engineer entire subsystems into existence. Made up of at least three sections, Havenage splits its power across an administrative section that manages the decision-making and organisational aspects of the station, a systems section tasked with managing the station's chaotic and mysterious network of power, information and technology, and finally a security section that provides the military muscle to police the station or fight off a hostile incursion should it be needed. Havenage's union past lives on in its commitment to a democratic decision-making process that requires committees and votes to pass resolutions on strategy and station affairs, but it it is openly conceded by the administrator Helen that this system has created a political quagmire full of factionalism, politicking and PR management. Certainly, the refugees of a nearby flotilla, the Yatagan gang, and even Feng himself, a Havenage employee, all voice concerns that Havenage has become bloated, tangled in restraints of its own making, and estranged from daily life, even if its intent may have once been noble. Economically, Havenage is still the top dog on the station, seeing as it controls all of the major ports and shipyards, as well as the station facilities. 
though as you move away from the industrial sites and towards the commercial and residential areas of the station, you can feel Havenage's influence slipping and eventually virtually disappearing altogether. Havenage would argue that they are the ones that provide the order and control that the station needs to function as a trade hub, and ultimately as a colony of sorts in its own right. Whereas its critics would say that it does a much better job of describing its responsibilities than it does in achieving them. Corporate slimeball Hardin has this to say about how he views Havenage's role in things. This place was hard fought for, Sleeper. It took work, diplomacy and strength to stop the eye descending into chaos after Solheim collapsed, not blind conviction or self-interest. Havenage aren't a gang like Yatagan, and we aren't pirates like half of the spaces you meet in the hub, or esoterics like those hyper radicals in the Greenway. We are the backbone of this place, proud and true. One thing is for sure, Havenage are a big part of the reason that the corporations haven't been able to regain the station as yet, but whether they are strong enough to endure long term, some have their doubts. Hardin himself says in a recorded conversation with Conway Extraction execs, Havenage is no longer strong, no longer united, no one here believes in Erlin's vision or has the strength to enact it. As a final note, Havenage as a word refers to the money that is due for the use of a harbour or port perhaps merely an appropriate name, but also perhaps indicative of their potentially extractive rentier existence. It's certainly food for thought, anyway. As we move around the wheel that makes up the main circular body of the station, away from the shipyards, we begin to move into the more heavily populated areas of the station. We start to see domiciles, vendors, bars, and just a more organic vibe to life start to take root. Where there are people, there is economic activity, and where there is economic activity, there is exploitation. Now, exploitation can take many forms, from the personal to the corporate and to the criminal. Whilst it is true that Havenage has a security branch of sorts, there seems to be little evidence of domestic protection or anything approaching policing, really. And this means there is an opportunity for someone to come in and either provide justice or to leverage the lack of it. Rabia, your contact within Yatagan, says, Our reputation is one that implies threat. Is that fair to say? We are framed as aggressors, parasites, criminals. But when was the last time you saw a lawmaker on the eye? A policeman who makes the laws here. The Yatagan are either the moral arbiters of street justice, protecting the people of the station where no one else will, or an organised crime syndicate extorting protection money and using their capacity for violence to dictate all activity through their areas of control. Havenage will certainly tell you that they are the latter, and will pay for information you can pick up on Yatagan activities, but they have something of a vested interest in maintaining control, and I think are somewhat embarrassed that an organised crime organisation has managed to embed itself so fully on the station. Rabia spells out where the difference in opinion stems from. Erlin's union was made up of workers and administrators, people who were malleable and already organised into hierarchies and networks. The refugees came from different factions and families, were scared, injured, desperate. Conflict was inevitable. Yatagan was a child of that conflict, a child born out of the need for us to stand up and claim our future, to provide security, strength. People call us a gang, but we are a community. Interestingly though, Rabia says of her place in it, I take my position as lieutenant seriously, and from my birth have worked to earn it. The combination of militaristic language and communal sentiments makes for an interesting pairing, and it's not hard to see why so many fear and malign Yatagan when they are very willing to flaunt their imagery, such as their blade-based symbology and militaristic titles. The Yatagan are certainly intimidating, and not afraid to use the threat of violence to get what they are owed, using mechanically augmented enforcers to police their territories and remind late payers. You owe what you owe, and by the time this town's faded, you want to pay. But it also can't be denied that they run medical clinics in the poorer areas. They smuggle in medicines and resources that can't be obtained through official channels, such as the stabiliser that you desperately need to maintain your frame as it succumbs to its planned obsolescence. Should you choose to work with the Yatagan, it can certainly be surmised that at least some of the organisation wants to help people, and they see themselves as a vital part of Erlin's Eye's ecosystem, providing services that Havenage can't, or won't, provide themselves. Are the Yatagan good guys? I'm not sure about that. They certainly seem to be running a for-profit operation and use intimidation and threats to ensure control of their customer base. This certainly isn't a socialist-minded group. Or to put it as Rabia does, Yatagan has not lasted this long because it is a charity. We offer and ask for support. Any betrayal is treated as an attack. That being said, are they perhaps better than the alternative? That being either no services at all or independent operators with their own agendas. 
One thing is for sure, whether good or bad, the Yatagan is certainly an important part of Erlen's eye, and another interesting note for you on the meaning of the faction name. A Yatagan was a type of curved short sword used primarily by the Ottoman Empire in the 16th to 19th centuries. It was a shorter, lighter blade that was easier for carrying on long marches than a traditional weapon, which might indicate that the Yatagan are a pragmatic evolution of an older form, or so one might be tempted to infer. At times, the Yatagan was also used as a tool for ceremonial purposes, with often ornately designed examples given to those responsible for acts of heroism or excellent generalship. Perhaps then, this name is to infer that as well as a martial and pragmatic focus as per the Ottoman Empire, that the Yatagan of Citizen Sleeper are honourable in their own way. Further on still from the streets, alleyways and markets of Low End, we pass a huge spire where a few of the higher market operations exist, but we are not headed there for our next faction of note exists across a broken part of the wheel, on the other side of the Founders Gap. Separate from the main body of the more or less fully operational station, and free of the direct influence of Havenage or the interest of the Yatagan, there exists a place known as the Greenway. The Greenway is something of a miracle, a thriving mass of life, greenery and mushrooms. Left abandoned after the fall of Solheim and the extensive damage to the station, this section was considered a write-off, even though it housed a somewhat modest hydroponics operation originally. However, a few believed it was still worth trying to save the plant life in spite of the warnings, and travelled across on the Founders Ferry to see what could be done to rescue what they expected would be a largely dead hydroponic space. Instead, as local botanist Rico describes it, when Haifa came here, we expected to find only vacuum dried stalks and leaves and perhaps some fungal colonies hidden in the mulch, but we found a jungle. The Greenway is now home to the Haifa Commune, a collective of people that work together to grow food for sale to the markets of Erlin's Eye, as well as to offer a refuge for those with no place to go and food for those who can't afford to eat. Rico, an elderly scientist who has been working in the Greenway for as long as anybody, is happy to share her thoughts on the Greenway's history and development, along with my rat's noisy drink bottle. Haifa lives off the land of the Greenway. It's what allows us to live like we do. No one here pays or is paid. We sleep here, we feed each other, we work for each other. Of course, Solheim tried to create a stable biosphere here, patchworking the surface with gardens and algae tanks that feed into a network of microbial reclamation systems. But the Greenway was always envisioned as extractive, a place from which the harvest is removed, sold to those living on the station, not a closed loop. For this reason, when the collapse came, the Greenway should have gone with it. Erlin himself was so convinced of it that his first colony never even came here to try and reclaim it. The eye instead relied on outside favours and influences, shipments from the inner system, and small-scale agricultural systems like kelp and fungal farm stacks. And yet here we are, among growth and decay, a biosphere flourishing. It doesn't make sense, but in many ways the system has stabilised. Unlike the farm stacks closer to the gap who need input to support their meagre output, this place runs itself. It is truly difficult to fully explain how fundamentally the discovery of the Haifa Commune changed my first playthrough. It was the first time I'd encountered anyone that offered food in exchange for your time rather than your money. The Haifa Commune doesn't appear to have much of a chain of command or any sort of central structure, but seems to operate off of a collective will to make this work. The alternative, the extractive exploitative melee that exists across the Founders Gap is pure anathema, and I must admit I spent a lot of my game time in the Greenway for this reason. The Greenway is not without its problems of course. It is still reliant on the station for power and maintaining its ecosystem, not to mention maintaining their place among the power struggles of the station. But there is a calm and an optimism to their outlook, particularly Rico, the main character that you interact with in the Greenway. Much like the station, Rico is getting older and finding things harder physically, but also like the station, the Greenway has given her a new lease of life and a reason to look ahead with hope as opposed to doom. In this way, Rico, the Haifa Commune and the Greenway feel very reminiscent of Solarpunk, the positive futurist tendency growing popular on the left, which tries to focus on the ways that we can survive capitalism and its climate crises rather than embracing the doom pill and giving up. The prevalence of mushrooms in the Greenway, in several varieties including the Matsutake specifically, are partial callouts by game creator Gareth Damian Martin to the book The Mushroom at the End of the World by Anna Lohenhap Singh, as well as to a number of other fungi related sources. We will talk a little bit more about that later Later, but Martin has said the following via the Fellow Traveller Games Discord. Mushroom at the End of the World was perhaps the most influential text on Citizen Sleeper, and the mushroom material in the game really followed on from me taking a specific interest in Singh's ideas around capitalism, assemblages, and community. They continue. 
I've spoken in a few interviews about how Singh's idea of capitalist ruins influenced the game very heavily, especially my conception of the eye as exactly that, and also how her idea of assemblages also helped me conceive of some of the social groups, ecology and systems that inhabit it. The Haifa Commune and the Greenway live in a symbiosis, with each tending to each other's needs. It feels very wholesome and ultimately is a very welcoming place, especially considering how sleepers are generally treated in the game. Over the course of the game, as you explore the digital side of the station, through the old pathways and networks, you may come to notice that you are unable to see into the network of the Greenway, and with good reason. Alongside the other AIs you encounter during the course of your explorations, you may be fortunate enough to meet Gardner, an old Solheim AI designed to manage the farms on the station, but one that has evolved beyond its original purpose, now becoming both the protector of the Greenway and the cultivator of life on the station. This AI also created a means for connection between intellects of all kinds, human, digital, fungal, floral, and harnesses all to create what it calls the chorus, a sort of digital commune where all are interlinked and act as one. This AI is powerful enough that it was able to tailor the plants and ecosystems in its care to both survive conditions on the station and to provide the nutrients and medical components needed for the humans of the station to survive too. Between the gardener tending the digital side and Rico exploring the physical side of the Greenway and its produce, the Greenway is easily my favourite part of Erlin's Eye and provides a potent reminder that where hope and togetherness remain, there is a chance for a brighter future. Oh, and the name. According to Wikipedia, Hypha means each of the branching filaments that make up the mycelium of a fungus. Not much is revealed about SNARP beyond their influence on the titular sleeper, with most of what we know being as a result of their pursuit. They certainly seem to own sleepers, so one might be tempted to infer that they produce the frames or are the patent holders for the emulation technology that allows the copying of human consciousness. Regardless, we do know that they have a ruthlessness entirely in keeping with corporate psychology, using both freelance and specialised bounty hunters to hunt down and reclaim lost property. We do discover, some way into the game, that SNARP has infiltrated Yatagat, and is using their artificial limbs and augments to test and monitor experimental tech. As per this from Street Doctor and former SNARP scientist Sabine, he, Yatagan traitor Yannick, has been using Yatagan enforcers as test subjects for SNARP technology. These are untested implants. These could short out, fail, cause cascading failures across a person's body. SNARP clearly treat sleepers badly enough that 10 of them are willing to die trying to escape their clutches, and do not trouble themselves over questions of sentience or questions of what constitutes life and deserves compassion. The sleeper considers the choice between risking their life, trying to escape SNARP, and staying as follows. Some were lost in the shaft, others never found the meeting point, only a few made it to the containers, but the freighter, as far as you know, left. That feels like enough. Enough to know that you might no longer be on that grim and heartless rock. Even if in the airless hold of a freighter, you might freeze solid long before you reached any destination. I can't find much on what they produce other than sleeper related business or their relative scale, but I do know that they represent the brutal profit driven moral vacuum that exists when you let capitalists write your laws. Conway extractions are not mentioned that many times during Citizen Sleeper but they have a significance that is worth mentioning. They are primarily all about salvage and mineral extraction, and the first time I remember hearing about them it was in relation to an ex-employee called Emphis, who was explaining the working conditions that led to them fleeing the job. In order to wield the huge mechanical work suits, Conway grafts them directly onto the bones of their workers to allow for closer one-to-one -one controls. As per the Citizen Sleeper wiki, the rate of failures was high, and failures meant arms torn off, anchors torn out, broken bones. After a while, Conway simply discontinued them, stating they were no longer competitive. Hundreds of workers with surgical alterations for suits that didn't work were left to fend for themselves. Conway sent them home, back to the company colonies to be cleaners, drivers, cooks. They got a pat on the back, drugs for the pain, and orders to work. So Conway are like SNARP, a pretty much typical corporation with worker safety and welfare the least of their concerns. Sleeper Citizen demonstrates the psychopathic nature of corporations time and time again, so this is not exactly a shock despite the grisly connotations. However, Conway's name does come up again in a storyline regarding a covert attempt to allow corporations to recapture Erlin's eye under the guise of a legal loophole should they be able to get the station classified as salvage, since its ownership is a matter of some debate in the core systems. Feng uncovers some evidence of this conspiracy and has this to say. 
Conway have been making moves on this system since the collapse. I heard they took over one of Solheim's old belt colonies a while ago, moved everyone out and reclaimed the whole rock. Whether you believe corporations like Conway Extractions want to recapture Erlin's Eye for its potentially useful location, or simply to take it away from what they consider to be the abomination of Havenage control, the threat to the safety of Erlin's Eye is far from over. The Sealess Foundation is the sponsor of a gigantic colony ship being built on the shipyards of Erlin's Eye, and for a great many people, the Sidereal colony ship is their only chance for a genuinely optimistic future. As the colonies and facilities in the system decay after the collapse of Solheim, it is natural that people begin to look for greener pastures, and Celis is no different in that regard, claiming that the main thing driving them is a wish to distance themselves from corporate space and the entanglements that suggests. The Celis Foundation offers work to residents of Erlin's Eye, as well as a chance to become a member of the crew via a sort of working lottery. The idea is that if you do X amount of hours working on the ship, you will be entered into a draw to continue on the ship as it makes its way to its new destination. This is an idea that excites many on the station, including the lovely Lem and Mina, a single father and daughter that are marooned on the station and looking for a chance to make a life somewhere, anywhere else. The Celis Foundation says of its own motivations, our citizens will be able to create their own innovative bottom-up economic order, aligned with the principles set down by Sandra Celis herself. Freedom, resilience and self-sustenance. Over the course of the game, you see Lem near killing himself working on the Sidereal, while you and their neighbour look after Mina, with Lem clinging on to the hope of winning the lottery with a near irrational faith. It has to work. It simply has to. However, if you follow the quest line and ensure the Sidereal is completed, you attend the draw for the lottery places, and the Celis Foundation announces via Vidcom that the draw will be done using a worker reference that none of the station's workers seem to have been given, or certainly the majority anyway. As it begins to dawn on the waiting crowds that some sort of mistake or con has been made, a riot begins to break out as hundreds of dreams are dashed on the shiny new hull of the Sidereal, as the narration puts it. Asta, the announcer, begins reading out sequences of numbers and letters, and panic begins to set in. No one seems to know what is happening. Somewhere near the front of the crowd, someone shouts in celebration, and everyone pushes forward. Someone throws something at the entrance, and it rattles against the shipyard doors. You see for the first time, Havenage security stood on either side, scared, arguing between themselves. You feel the anger rising in the crowd. The Sealess Foundation are not the anti-corporation hope that they made themselves out to be early on, or if they are, they are poorly organised enough that risking the journey with them might be ill-advised anyway. The enigmatic information broker Castor shares their opinion on the Sealess Foundation a bit later on. An ugly business. Sealess are too used to the way things work in the core. Exploitation is the only logic they know. You know why they built this, gesturing at the colony ship on the eye? Celis built it here because they don't want anybody to know it exists. There are people being loaded onto that ship as we speak. Sleeping people, locked into cryosleep like the person you were emulated from. There are hundreds of them, and Celis wants to send them to a planet at the edge of the settled systems without anyone knowing where it is. Now, Castor is not the most reliable source of info, but if any of this is true, one might wonder if those in cryosleep were willing participants, or if they are being taken beyond the reaches of civilization for some unsavoury purpose. You don't really get to find out too much about them as an organisation in this game, but they are an interesting and important player in the politics of Erlen's Eye, if only temporarily. The DLC of Citizen Sleeper introduces us to a new faction, or to be more accurate, three new factions reluctantly thrown together, those being the refugee fleets of Ember's Step, Hearth and Song, that are fleeing the collapse of their colonies following both the destruction of Solheim and a new threat called the Flux, which is effectively a periodic pulse that damages all electronics and digital equipment beyond repair. Their flight has led them to Erlen's Eye, given its location as a colonial hub for the sector, though their arrival has led to a less than friendly greeting from Havenage, who fear the flotilla's needs might overwhelm the station's ability to support them. The three Ember colonies barely get on between them, so the further challenges of a reluctant Havenage raises tensions even higher as supplies begin to run low in the flotilla. Each fleet has experienced hardship, whether from the dunes of the steppe, the industrial furnace of the Song, or the loss of a thriving city on Hearth, 
and this has led to a hardening of hearts and a growing resentment of each other's circumstance. The flotilla are not organised enough to have any form of a unified agenda, and mostly just want to be able to stop running, though circumstances in that regard are not in their favour. The flotilla are treated as both a threat and a harbinger of a coming doom by Havenage, who fear the loss of what little stability exists on the eye, as much as any concerns over resource scarcity. During the course of the excellent DLCs, which are free by the way, uh, you meet Peek and Esh, who are attempting to get supplies through the blockade to the refugees. Peek introduces themselves thusly. We are with the refugees, the ones Havenage have cordoned off from entering the station, before Esh interrupts saying, the ones that are being quarantined in makeshift vessels that barely made it to the eye to begin with, the ones that your station administrators have called an existential risk and are running out of supplies while their right to safety is being debated by people with no stake in their future. Esh is an excellent stand-in for the moral indignation many feel when they see the way the UK government has handled immigration, and more particularly asylum seekers in the last 30 years. Whether under Blair, Cameron, May, Johnson or Sunak, people die crossing the English Channel because we choose to make it as difficult as possible for people to access legitimate crossings to our country. Esh's righteous rages against what she sees as the cold corporate style management of Havenage are very raw and very evocative. This can at times create trouble for their cause. But in her character I see the impassioned plea for kindness and consideration once championed by Corbyn and his following when he rallied against Theresa May's hostile environment. Anyway, Helene, an admin section worker for Havenage, tries to articulate that they want to help the flotilla, but that there are right-wing factions of the Havenage decision-making committee that are agitating for a hardline no to the flotilla's request for aid. Helene is a quintessential liberal, making sad noises about how her hands are tied, and if everyone can just do as they're told, she is sure that reasonable debate will come to a solution that works for everyone. Her naivety would be almost sweet if it wasn't for the fact that thousands of lives are teetering on the brink whilst they debate their responsibilities in their committees, and in fact, once she actively turns cop and tries to stop assistance getting through to the flotilla, she reveals herself as exactly that a liberal cop. The same corporate ruthlessness that Havenage formed to fight against has claimed yet more victims in the refugees from the Ember colonies, but this form of Havenage seems strangely torn about the correct thing to do. It is perhaps not right to call the flotilla a faction, since it does effectively have three leaderships, three ideologies and three visions for the way forward. And in fact most of those travelling with the flotilla are likely never consulted as to what they want or what they think is the best strategy moving forward. The flotilla operates probably closest to the Haifa commune, by necessity more than ideology, with resources pooled amongst the refugees, albeit with divisions by colonial origin. After a bit of work and coordination, you can get the hearth and step fleets working together, but the refugees from the worker planet of Ember's Song carry a deep bitterness against the other two, a belief that the Song is treated as an underclass and expected to do the grunt work because of their colony's history. It's pretty sad, actually to see these refugees refusing to work with others beyond immediate necessity because of the way their colonies were put together by Sibel's system. It reminds me of when people talk of how the British Empire carved up the world with a pen and ruler, creating geographical, cultural and ethnic conflicts simply by designating countries with little or no thought. Ultimately, the people that Ember Song should be the most angry at are Sibel's system and by extension Solheim Industries for considering their world's graph, toil and risk as an acceptable cost of maintaining a profitable colony on Ember's half. But that's easy to say when you aren't the one under the boot, isn't it? The tragedy of the flotilla is the tragedy of all great refugee crises. Ordinary people being harmed and threatened by interests far removed from the day to day. In this case, it is the collapse of an extractive capitalism that ate its own legs out from underneath itself, leaving the colonies vulnerable and alone. The flux, the destructive magnetic pulse of mysterious origin, was the last straw for these refugees, necessitating them climbing onto their makeshift fleet and heading towards the eye and beyond. It is also important to mention that the flotilla is not everyone from the Ember colonies. Many remained behind, out of fear of change, out of love for their homes, or out of hope for some kind of miracle. The refugees of the flotilla have already lost loved ones, their homes, and to some degree their self-identities. Can Erlin's eye possibly accommodate them? Or is it simply an ask too much for the creaking old bones of the shattered station? I don't want to spoil too much more than I already have. You should have a play yourself to see if you can shape the future of the flotilla. Citizen Sleeper has themes out the eyeballs, but there are two types that we need to understand before we can go on any further. 
There are the intended themes, the ones that we know that creator Gareth Damien Martin put there as a deliberate choice. And then there are the ones that I interpret above and beyond what I know of the game. Sometimes there will be overlap, and other times I may get something from the game entirely different from anyone else. The fun thing about art and opinions is that their subjectivity is what makes them interesting, and whilst you may not agree with all my thoughts, my thoughts still exist. First up, Precarity. Precarity is the name of the game. Main game creator Gareth Damien Martin has said on several occasions that they wanted to build their experience with precarity into a form that can be understood and explored using game mechanics. In an interview with Wired in July 2022, Martin said this, So many structures around us apply pressure to our lives. It's on us to be healthy, successful and content. We're all scrambling to achieve these things in competition with one another, fighting over jobs, opportunities, property, even social standing. The only thing that separates someone from the comforts of success or the despair of failure is being arbitrarily judged as being good at something arbitrarily valuable. That's an incredibly precarious method of validating our right to exist with dignity. They continue. Our world is full of systems we can't ever conceivably control. We are surrounded by tiny, fragile walls. When these walls buckle and break, we tumble towards mental breakdown, bankruptcy, destitution, or even death. Anyone that has grown up in the UK, mainland Europe, or the US will probably know this feeling. As jobs and pay get steadily worse, housing costs rise faster than anyone has any right to expect, and any idea of a safety net consists of hoping you have wealthy parents. Citizen Sleeper takes all that, pushes it into a syringe and injects it straight into whatever part of your brain, that's my arm, and injects it directly into whatever part of your brain handles anxiety. Okay, that, that's a rather melodramatic way of putting it, but this game weaponizes precarity in a way that no game that pauses should be able to. Your character, the sleeper, has to balance escaping from SNARP, earning money, buying food, buying stabilizer to stop your artificial organs being rejected by your frame, completing tasks to further your ambitions of escape, or even just helping someone out. To do all these things, you generally need to take actions, and actions cost dice. Each day, Based off your internal levels of stabilizer and food energy, you receive up to five dice rolls. And those are what you will use to power your actions. You spend a die, and the face value will go into a skill check to decide the outcome of that action. So success is far from guaranteed even when you spend a die. Those dice rolls need to be enough for all those requirements, and of course, especially early on in the game, you will not have access to five dice very often. The hard choices you have to make when you have three dice, and have rolled two ones and a three, and realise that these will have to feed you, earn enough currency to buy the extortionately priced stabiliser, and deal with the many different time pressures that come every day, it's a lot. And that's kind of the point. Citizen Sleeper wants you to feel under pressure. It wants you to always have just less than what you need, to always be one dice roll away from safety, at least until you get further into the game anyway. It is designed to get a little easier as you make it into the mid game, as the focus changes from struggling to stay alive to struggling to achieve agency and to begin pursuing your own agenda. But the pressures ease, they do not go away by any stretch of the imagination. A sleeper, much like a replicant in Blade Runner, has an internal clock that is always ticking down, and with each segment that passes, your powers get weaker and the challenge gets harder. There is very little you can rely on in this game, and that is the point. Precarity is a 21st century weapon wielded by capitalism to ensure cheap subservient labour, and on Erlin's eye, the vestigial remains of a once great capitalist machine, it is wielded still. Alienation and dehumanisation. Karl Marx observed himself when talking of the alienation of labour that the capitalist reduces the worker to just an instrument, a tool without the will to apply its own labour as it sees fit, instead contorting itself to fit the demands of the capitalist. The sleeper is of course the natural continuation of this logic, with a worker becoming a literal automaton, or living tool, existing only to serve the will of those who own that tool. In this way, Citizen Sleeper adds commentary on both Marx's theory of worker alienation, that being the removal of the worker from the material and social fruits of their own labour, and the nature of slavery. Firstly, alienation is a concept I have touched on before in my dredge video, but essentially what we are talking about is a combination of factors that distance the worker from the products of their own work, creating a hollow and unfulfilling cycle that grinds down the self-worth and self-realisation of a person. The worker doesn't choose what to produce, when to produce it, what to use their product for, and who gets to use it. 
In most cases, they may never even get to see the end product, and so their part in the process is obscured and abstracted, treated as just another tool in the machine, another cog turning and playing its part, but never given any autonomy or agency. It is not a huge stretch then, when we talk about the use of workers as mere tools, that we then begin to think about the use of slavery as a means to achieve the same thing. With sleepers being legally owned, the idea of slavery is made plain and your emulated mind, despite its many signifiers of intelligence, emotional complexity and self-awareness, is given no more agency than the power tools they wield in the service of their corporate masters. Slavery has long been a tool of capital, and particularly of colonialism and empire, given that profit necessitates the minimization of all costs, first and foremost amongst them always being labour costs. Indeed, in the UK, a country that is often proud to claim that it freed the slaves without the need for a civil war, our approach was far from altruistic, nor was it about some realisation that slavery was wrong, as this quote from the History Press puts it. The act had two major parts to it, the emancipation of all slaves throughout the British colonial empire, except those held by the East India Company, and compensating slave owners for the loss of the slaves. The slaves themselves received no such compensation. So the capitalists were paid off for the release of their property, and little thought or compensation was given to those freed. Class interest once again raising its head. See class interest video. Citizen Sleeper reminds us that these realities persist, and that class interests, as displayed by the largely aristocratic parliamentary system of Great Britain in the 19th century, will ensure that those with capital will be looked after long before those under them. The collapse of Solheim and the carving up of their assets by the smaller corporations like Conway, XPR and the mysterious Senate Stack Company demonstrate this ably, all whilst entire colonies are left to struggle and die out. The commodification of time. One of the things that really resonated with me whilst playing Citizen Sleeper is the use of segmented meters to represent things such as the size and complexity of a task, or more poignantly, a clock ticking down. So there will be some of these meters that you'll be looking to fill up and some that you are racing against. Your ability to affect these outcomes is dependent on the number of action dice you have available and the results of what they have rolled. If you are freshly topped up on stabilizer and are well fed, you will have five dice or five opportunities to perform an action in a day's span. You may, for example, spend one to feed yourself, one to earn some money, and three to progress the different objectives you are interested in. However, if you are struggling to source stabilizer and can't afford to acquire food, your number of available dice will be lessened, creating a significantly great challenge. Every element of the game is viewed through this lens. The time and energy you have available has to be rationalized out, ensuring that your basic needs are met before you can consider anything else. This gives each of your action dice a value to you, and it makes you weigh up the worth of different actions. This adoption of time as a resource that holds value leads us to a couple of interesting thoughts. Firstly, that time essentially becomes a commodity itself, being something that can be traded for another value, be it money, social status, or progressing a wider task. If we look at how neoliberalism has done the same thing in the UK, embracing precarity and encouraging people to adopt a grind set. Oh, it's even gross to say. Grind set is obviously a play on mindset, and it is essentially an attempt to guilt us all to supplement insufficient wages using the monetization of hobbies, additional jobs, and just any use of your time beyond your working day. It's asking you to think of your time like a citizen sleeper meter, to value your time against an opportunity cost, which is a kind of gross economic speak for, in the last hour you could have earned X, but instead you played football manager. Citizen Sleeper successfully recreates that feeling, with its commodification of time, reducing life to a series of value equations, which feels quite bleak, at least until your character gets a foothold on the station anyway. Secondly, the commodification of time, or the assigning of value to chunks of it, allows for the reverse to be true, that if you can effectively sell your time, someone can also buy it. This is a feature of class structure under capitalism that allows rich people to outsource domestic labor and social reproductive responsibility to those that need the money. Or, to use Citizen Sleeper's mechanics, they can buy additional action dice using their wealth and resources, allowing them additional agency at the same time that yours is being reduced in order to make enough money to eat or afford stabilizer. Commodification always favors those that hold an above average amount of either a commodity or wealth, and Citizen Sleeper shows you this lesson time and again with very few exceptions. Addiction. Addiction is increasingly understood to be equal parts physical, psychological, and societal, and great strides have been taken in investigating which treatments work best to alleviate its symptoms, 
and perhaps to even temper its causes. That being said, it is quite notable that UK and US governments have failed to keep up with the increasingly effective treatments and policy proposals that primarily look to change the way that drug and alcohol addiction are handled by state institutions, making them more of a medical concern as opposed to a criminal one. And going further, why is it that gambling websites and video game developers, two industries notorious for exploiting addictive behaviours that disproportionately affect the vulnerable, seem to be able to continue virtually unimpinged despite evidence showing the damage they cause? Well, we both know the answer, right? Clearly it's money. An addictive behaviour that creates profit will always be the last thing that gets curtailed by a neoliberal government. National lotteries, likewise, have often been referred to as attacks on the poor for the way that they dangle the hope of an end to precarity in return for a relatively modest weekly sum. Well, gambling, in other words. Oh yeah, and don't look up how many MPs have ties to the gambling industry, will you? What has any of this got to do with Citizen Sleeper? Well, Stabilizer acts as a physical and psychological restraint in Citizen Sleeper, ensuring that you always have one eye on your stabilizer levels and on the need to earn enough money to buy the next dose. What of the social component though? Well, we have previously spoken about the literal use of stabilizer as a means for ensuring that sleepers aren't able to abscond with their precious frames. But I think in this instance, the stabilizer and the idea of addiction is part of the wider metaphor for precarity. Sleepers must work, must obey and must remain, or the system under which they labour will withhold their means to continue living. Stabiliser becomes simply wages. We earn or we become homeless. Suddenly that feels very real, doesn't it? Wage slavery and the related fears of poverty and destitution are represented via a literal life or death drug that can only be legally sourced for your employer, or in this case, your owner. Mushrooms, mushrooms, mushrooms. Gareth Damien Martin has mentioned on a number of occasions that they took a lot of inspiration from Anna Singh's book The Mushroom at the End of the World, which examines the Matutaki mushroom trade and how its very existence represents something significant in the coming struggle of our world. Indeed, as Wikipedia puts it, the mushroom at the end of the world uses the Matsutaki as a focal point for exploring what Singh describes as the end of capitalist progress as ecological degradation and economic precarity proliferate in the 21st century. It's a bit of a mouthful, that. Whew. Now, obviously, Matsutaki mushrooms feature fairly prominently in Citizen Sleeper, and mushrooms in general can play a fairly large role in the day-to-day -day life of the mid-game, certainly in my experience. But there is more here, more layers to this apparent homage to the book. So we're going to look at a number of themes all related to mushrooms. Firstly, mushrooms as a delicacy. Everyone's favourite chef, Emphis, asks you to acquire some Girol caps from the mushroom groves of the Greenway, as these are not plentiful in general and Emphis relishes the opportunity to test his culinary abilities. Indeed, there are several varieties of mushroom that can be found or cultivated in the Greenway, and some are quite valuable indeed. The reverence shown by Emphis in particular reminds me of when Anna Singh talks of the cultural importance of Matsutake in Japan, where they are commonly used as gifts, as opposed to simply a treat or delicacy. They are used to convey the seriousness and depth of a relationship between two parties. Because of the difficulty in finding and harvesting matsutake, rather than simply making them a sought-after ingredient in the same vein as a rare truffle, instead it is something of a social catalyst, inherently linked as it is to maintaining human networks. Naturally, this has several thematic resonances for us, given the underground connectivity of fungi, Singh's talk of biological relationship between species, and of course, Erlin's eyes ethereal networks that link the station's digital self to the physical world. Mushrooms as sustenance. Of course, not every mushroom is a matsutake, but every variety of edible mushroom in the Greenway has a very important value for a space station, that being as food. The game does not let you simply eat the mushrooms you find, of course, making you go through emphis, for example. But mushrooms and fungus remain an important part of the station's food supply, and indeed, once the refugee flotilla arrives from the ember colonies, you can present them with mushrooms as part of the relief effort. Bri, can you drink more quietly, please? Mushrooms as a commodity. As already mentioned above, mushrooms hold value for a number of reasons, and in a number of different ways, the crudest being market value. Some of the rarer varieties are desired by exporters on the station, such as the value they hold in the popular imagination. Again, the story of the Matsutake, as told by Anna Singh in her book, is one of its value to several different parties and for several different reasons, whether it be cultural, culinary or capital. Ultimately, however, regardless of the why, there remains a market for Matsutake, and a high commercial value assigned to it as a result. And this is also reflected in-game. Mushrooms as symbiosis. 
As you progress through some of the storylines in the Greenway, one of my favourite characters, the weird and philosophical Rico, talks of how close Hypha Commune came to failure when they first came to the Greenway. The Greenway is like an organism itself, one that seeks to embrace other life, to take humans into its networks and work with them, and the mushrooms are its way of manifesting this sentiment. Indeed, not long after you arrive in the Greenway and begin working with the fungi there, a new type of mushroom begins to emerge, which when tested by Rico, appears to have the components needed to create Stabilizer, the very thing you need as a sleeper in order to exist, and the Greenway and its mushroom groves have provided it, sustainably. You tend to the groves, you spread the spores, and the mushrooms that grow tailor themselves to your needs. Anna Singh, in her book, describes this kind of unpredictable interspecies relationship when talking of how certain fungus and certain trees build relationships that are unexplainable by selfish gene philosophies, and how things like Matsutake mushroom patches often form at sites of human disruption. This creation of random symbiosis, of mutual benefit and intertwined fate out of chaos and happenstance, stand as a metaphor for the sleeper's own arrival at the station, and pretty much everything that follows mushrooms as a network. As mentioned earlier, the hypha of the hypha commune refers to each of the branching filaments that make up the mycelium of a fungus, according to the Oxford Dictionary. And this name is appropriate on several layers. The commune attempts to live in harmony with the Greenway, regarding its presence there as being a privilege, and one that they wish to respect by behaving in accordance with the balance of life. However, in the digital network, protected from sight, there exists another layer of the fungal consciousness, overseen by an old evolved AI entity called the Gardener, that maintains and adapts the Greenway to benefit all who exist within it. The Gardener is the one who ensured the sprouting of the mushrooms that made the commune possible, and was behind the sprouting of the mushrooms that could be made into stabilizer too. They have cultivated a great network of life that exists connected in a harmonious chorus of information and exchanges of understanding. A true commune that the humans are unable to fully appreciate, but you, with your emulated mind and digital spirit, can. Indeed, the wider station too can sometimes share some of these characteristics, perhaps not in such an organised and curated fashion as the Greenways network, but in the way that a large enough group of people can sometimes take on the characteristics of an organism. To repeat something Feng said earlier, residents here look up at the eye and think they are seeing a constant, a concrete reality. But this place is a system in constant flux, decaying and growing, collapsing into new configurations. What is life, anyway? Throughout our time in Citizen Sleeper, we encounter fungi that react to life around it, AIs that have evolved from strictly functional constructs into great philosophical guardians of life, and humans that have forsaken consciousness to pay off debts. We meet humans that were once grafted onto machines, killers with no humanity, and digital copies of a human's mind. We often hear the station, Erlen's eye, talked of as if a living creature, with descriptions of its functions described in organic and visceral fashion, blurring the lines between an object and an organism. The sleeper themselves battles with the idea that they feel one way but exist in another, a source of dysmorphia where their lived experience and personal identity are in conflict at all times, as their digital mind seeks to understand its frame as anything other than a cage where their body should be. I have seen some mention that Citizen Sleeper spoke to them on some level as a metaphor for queerness or transgenderism, and I'm not about to speak on that given my cishetness, but I think there is definitely something to consider there by those more able to convey that experience. Transhumanism though is something to think about. Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube fame did a great video on this a while back, so I will link to that around here somewhere. But in essence, the blending of organic and mechanical elements creates something of a challenge for us philosophically. Despite many of us identifying as atheist, agnostic, or just non-spiritual, I think a lot of us hold on to the idea that to be alive involves something more complex than a flesh suit and electrical impulses. That there must be something slightly more elevated. What happens then if we replace our limbs or our organs? Does our soul, for want of a better word, survive intact? What if it was just our brain left in a mechanical suit like Robocop? Are we still the same person? Are we still alive? Let's go even one step further. If we can map out every single cell of our brain, every synapse, every pathway, every memory, and we put that information into a hard drive, does that hard drive now contain the essence of a person? Where does alive and artificial cease to have a meaningful differentiation? A sleeper challenges all of this, containing what appears to be a person and yet not. 
is mind emulation a form of cloning, creating another person by effectively duplicating the mind? And are clones alive in the traditional sense? Do we share a soul with our clones, or do we generate one at the moment the spark of life enters a new frame, body, or brain? I am woefully under-equipped to unpick this one. Watch the Philosophy Tube video link previously and make up your own mind. I will simply leave you with this question. If someone can provably replicate every single aspect of your brain digitally, and you do not consider that emulation alive, what more would it need for you to do so? Citizen Sleeper spoke to me about two main concepts, the inevitable end of the world we know, and the need to remain optimistic that we will find new ways to endure. Citizen Sleeper adeptly addresses precarity, the commodification of time, the use of addiction as a tool for exploitation, and the use of violence as a means for disciplining labour. It shows you the collapse of an interplanetary market and the terrible vacuum it leaves behind once the profit potential is no longer adequate to maintain the greedy excesses that capitalism requires to operate. It demonstrates how little life matters to corporations once the profit motive has switched to a new target, and how, as Marx himself summarised, workers become nothing but tools in industry and just as disposable. Citizen Sleeper is about those disposed of in the face of capitalism's failure to address its own contradictions. What is left when the framework around us one we were told was inevitable, unquestionable and beyond reproach, simply ceases to function anymore. I imagine many of us know a bit about how that feels. But Gareth Damien Martin is asking us to think beyond the edge of the cliff, to peer into the abyssal darkness and look not into doom and the end. They want us to notice the mushrooms that have made the abyssal wall their home. Out of the death of capitalism, Erlen's eye floats as a physical reminder that life has managed to continue despite the many threats to its relative freedom and indeed at times, its very existence. The titular sleeper has many choices as to how best to spend their time in Citizen Sleeper. They can run, boarding outbound ships and trying to constantly find new sources of stabiliser, searching for meaning among the stars. They can embrace their digital identity, abandoning their frame and becoming an incorporeal intelligence, part of the ghostly network of the eye, part of a semi-immortal but aloof form of existence that ensures their dependence on stabiliser is severed permanently, and they needn't ever be alone again. They can, of course, also die or be killed, which in a great many ways is a valid ending too, for what is more human than mortality. But my favourite ending is the one where the sleeper chooses to make Erlen's eye their home helping others, creating an environment where their life is not only sustainable, but perhaps even desirable. The choice where the sleeper accepts where they landed and makes a home out of what they find, like a seed on the wind. The choice where life continues even when everyone else says it's impossible. The primary message I get from Citizen Sleeper is to not lose hope. That as bleak as things look, we can create something good in the aftermath. That even after death, there can come life. Go play Citizen Sleeper. It's a tabletop RPG, it's a visual novel, and it's a life sim. It's more than all of that, and even if those things aren't your usual thing, trust me, this is worth your time. It's a heartwarming exploration of character, of tone, and of philosophy. And what do you want for the sleeper? What do you want to happen after capitalism finally devours itself? What will you do? when the choice is yours. It's time to wake up, sleeper. Thank you for watching to the end. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope there was something of value in there for you, whether it was whetting your appetite for playing Citizen Sleeper for the first time, prepping for the upcoming sequel, or just soaking up some random's opinion on a game you already love. Big thanks go out to Mrs Inside Left for helping me streamline and improve the script and for her support as ever. And to Gareth Damien Martin for just making an excellent game and for being prepared to talk about their philosophies and thought process in multiple interviews, podcasts and even Discord Q&As. Citizen Sleeper 2 is one I already have my eye on and who knows, maybe there will be a follow up to this video using that as fuel. Make sure you give Citizen Sleeper a chance, and if you enjoy it, make sure to check out the additional narrative content known as the Helium Dispatches too. It all adds to this great sense of a wonderful world being built, and it's really fun to be part of. Thanks again everyone for watching, be good to each other, let's be good people, bye for now.